Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our 222nd Coffee and Conversation. Uh, again, it's amazing the number we've gone through by now, and again, the topics and the speakers have just been fascinating. And certainly today we have a, uh, a fascinating speakers uh, as well, Colonel McDonald, uh, who you know, spent 30 years with the Army, and he would have his, uh, uh, in, his info sheet there, and we'll give a little more introduction shortly. Uh, but before then, I would like a couple of announcements. Uh, I'd like to highlight our next upcoming talks. So, next Saturday, which is not normally a coffee and conversation at E2, We'll be having a special visit by the American Military Living History Group. This is the marvelous reenactors who uh, reenact all the different periods of service in our history. And they will be joining us with the Mild High Fife and Drum Corps. And this will be from 10 to about 2. Uh, we're also going to have a, a, a Civil War era cannon present here. Where you'll get a chance to talk actually as a gun crew if you like. Uh, so please join us. And that's next Saturday. Uh, the Saturday after that is when our next coffee and conversation will be. And that's Tracy Perry. And he will be talking about Doolittle, an American hero. Uh, Tracy has actually met General Doolittle, several of the other flyers there. And as part of this talk, He's going to be making a presentation to the museum of a marvelous print, which marks the beginning of the Doolittle Raid of the USS Hornet. Uh, it also will be the start of the new Forefathers exhibit upstairs, commemorating the 80th anniversary uh, from the start of the Doolittle Raid. So we'll have quite a lot of different things going on that day. So the next two weeks, you know, certainly please try to join and come and visit us. Uh, I would like to offer uh, Craig and Barb uh, to briefly comment on your marvelous nonprofit group qualified listeners. Good morning, everybody. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, we run an organization called Qualified Listeners. And what we are is a veteran and family resource hub. If any veteran has anything that they need that they're not getting, give us a call. And we have flyers upstairs. We have lots of literature around here. Uh, we work a lot with the VA, but 65% of veterans are not in the VA. So we work with all the, the <laughs> VA veterans as well as all the free range veterans who are out there. So that's what we do. This is our sixth year. We're a nonprofit. We're located in Frederick, and we cover. Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico so far. So it's an honor to be here. And this is my bride, Mark. Good morning. Thank you, Mike. Um, one thing I would like to let you know about uh, in May, mid May, May 14th to be exact, we are hosting our third regional event for veterans. It's called Vet Connect. And the reason it's called Vet Connect is our purpose is to connect veterans with other veterans. It's going to be held at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Loveland, uh, just right off the interstate uh, from 10 to 1. And the purpose of this, um, we are going to showcase uh, veterans from all branches and all eras. And uh, we have one quarter of the ballroom reserved. And in the middle of our event room will be tables for uh, one for each uh, each branch of the service. They're going to be eight foot round tables with chairs, and there will be a sign when you walk in. If you're from the Army or the Navy, then you can see where your table is. And we uh, will have volunteers there to uh, greet you and to chat with you a little bit. There's going to be refreshments there, and uh, it's free admission, free parking. They're not going to have to sign up for anything. They're not going to have to buy anything. Okay. What a pleasure. We weren't able to hold it last year because of COVID, but what we have found is a lot of our veterans 
I have missed the camaraderie and the fellowship that they haven't been able to have in the last two, the last two years. And this is about camaraderie and fellowship. And we would absolutely love to have you join us. We've had a flyer posted over there for the past uh, month or so, but I do have flyers here. If you are interested, I'll just have them over here um, for, for you to pick yeah, up. Put them on the back table. The back table. Easy. Okay, I will do that. And uh, so that's really all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, David. Uh, one more. Good morning, everybody. I uh, thought that uh, you might be interested in something that's going to be happening here in about a month. There are two flying B-29s in the entire world, Doc and PP. Doc is going to be out at Wings Over the Rockies at Centennial Airport on the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th of May. They're going to have uh, ground tours available on the 6th and on the 7th and the 8th. They'll have ground tours, and if you want, you can even take a flight on PV. I'm sorry, on DOC. Not, ex not exactly inexpensive, but something you might want to consider. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Don. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, my name is Don Tega, and I'm a brand new member of the museum. Um, and my first assignment has been really enjoyable, but it was putting together this presentation for Matt um, mm -hmm. Colonel McDonald. I did slide those. Um, that's not what it's going to be. It's not going to be a formal presentation. It's certainly going to be a talk. Matt is going to talk to you and, and, and inform you um, about his role in the negotiation process of the Paris Peace Accords and feeding them with the protocols for the prisoner exchange, as well as his trip north to get them the first prisoner in the home. So it's a conversation, just like the title of this program um, states it is. So let's just let Bob talk and let's talk to Bob and enjoy what he has to say. We have a few pictures and, and newspaper clippings that he um, provided that we have sort of as a, they were incorporated in this one, but I think we have split them out and at the end we can show them and, and Matt can sort of tell you what they're all about. Okay? And uh, it was with really great honor and um, it's a lot of personal pleasure that I'd like to introduce you to. Um, Retired Colonel Robert Mack McDonald. Yeah, please welcome and greet him. And <laughs> well, thank you very much. It will be informal. And I'll just kind of talk through a little bit of my previous career that led me to Vietnam and got me into the prisoner. You won't need to hold that. <laughs> We already have the got to go. I don't have to do that. Yeah. It's already It's great. 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 Scholarship and uh, at the end of the summer camp, they said, Hey, McDonald, you can have a regular army commission if you want. Took it and I stayed with it. Really enjoyed it. But I would like to go maybe time in 1965. I was at Fort Bragg and I had a special forces unit detachment and we did a lot of good training and a uh, lot of jumping also and I went through jump master school there and, and as you read in there that I parachuted out of 10 different types of aircraft and, and in doing that and all these different exercises it was a lot of fun for a young guy and I enjoyed it a lot and during the time I was there I received orders for Vietnam and so I said okay fine and uh, my background also said, hey, this guy should be an advisor. So I was an advisor with him, the Vietnamese Army. So 
But going across, they, they sent me to the Language Institute School for Vietnamese. And I used that the entire year. It took a long time to become fluent in the language. I did with seven different uh, advisory groups that are going down to the village level, the district level, to help them set up security against the Viet Cong and the NBA coming down and through uh, South Vietnam. And that uh, kept me going and moved went through the entire uh, country in my uh, travels. And so I was pretty much uh, aware of what was going on until when I got back here. Uh, several years later, I had Agent Orange. Well, there, <laughs> you know what happened there? We were defoliating the, the canopy up in a lot of different areas, and I was in quite a few of them, and I got that, so I had to had that removed, but other than that, I had no wounds or anything, but I did lose a couple of my guys that worked on my teams, and it was a very uh, busy time. Ted Offensive happened in 68, and I was there also, and uh, you can imagine what that, that was like. It was terrible. And I think there was, as they reported, about 30,000 killed and wounded during that pencil. And that was really a big time. And so, as I got through that first year, went back. 1972, they had me come back. And I was assistant uh, uh, in, in security and that type of thing for the entire South Vietnam, it was communications. And uh, it also did for Cambodia and Thailand. But halfway through uh, my assignment, Henry Kessinger, the doctor from North Vietnam, were in Paris and they started negotiations to end the war. And those negotiations <laughs> went on for some time. And I was tasked. Uh, to get an accurate report of all the prisoners of war that we had in captivity. That took me about a month. Yeah, we didn't have technology like we have today. We went to the prisoner of war camps. <laughs> and the camp down off of here in Fuquag Island, we had 22,000 prisoners in. And uh, and all of our prisons, we had about four of them through the country. And they were all operated by South Vietnamese soldiers advised by U.S. We didn't have the punishment to hear about them later on. But anyway, uh, it took us that long, and then we got a list of 24,734 prisons. Sent that to Henry Kissinger, who was in Paris for three October. And they completed the agreement on 27th January, 7.30 Anyway, it stipulated that all U.S. and indigenous forces allied with our country in South Vietnam be out of country in 60 days. All prisoners of war would be exchanged in 60 days. And that included the ones of North Vietnam prisoners at the head of ours. You can see how that really went. And so they uh, assigned me as the position for the United States being a four-party commission for repatriation of intermediate prisoners of war. And we were tasked with, one is to determine the release sites in South Vietnam, also the mode of transportation to get the prisoners out of our camps to those release sites. And also to determine the, uh, the phasing, the four phases it took some time to, to do this. And so it was one thirty was it the Air Force would fly it out at Utapau in Thailand, and all of the, the coordination was done through MACB headquarters. And we had a large group in there that coordinated with the Air Force when we needed them. And you know, we had to that many prisoners to move in 60 days, you can imagine what was going on. It was difficult. And uh, we had, in our team, just I had four members. I was going all the time, three or four hours sleep the entire time. I was moving, but in the peace agreement, they also uh, set up an international control commission 
and they would go to each of our releases to make sure it was going properly. We had a Canadian Polish officer, a Hungarian uh, representative, and an Indonesian representative. So they were at every release that I was at. They would make sure that it was going properly, the papers were correct. And uh, so I met a number of those people, and I'll show you one of them on one of my slides. We started moving. People initially, though, we moved a group called, uh, they, were, they, were, they wanted to have their allegiance with South Vietnam. 10,891. And they pledged that they would support the South Vietnam government. So they released those first. So we had about four or five locations we could take them to. South Vietnamese governor gave, gave them 4,000 dong, which was about $100 in U.S. currency. Once we dropped them off, that $100 allowed them to get transportation to get back to where they used to live. So that 10,000. 981 we released right from the 27th uh, three was signed the day after 1 February all released in that time. So then later on that started on our regular releases. One of the sites that we had for the North Vietnamese was right up here on the Takhan River that separated South Vietnam from North Vietnam. NBA, we released them all in that location. And to go across the river, they had a bridge that went over, but it was damaged. And there were, a lot of the times we had to put the prisoners in low, small boats and boat them across the river. But anyway, that, that was for the NBA. For the BC, we had it down in Lock Min. Lock Min was somewhere around there. <laughs> big country, I can't see exactly, but anyway, it was right on the border of Cambodia. We had two airfields that could actually accept C-130s, and the others had it, just didn't, they couldn't do it. Lock Man had one, and the, the runway was all PSV metal uh, on that runway, but we did a lot of bombing. Grapnels up, came up through there, and when they landed, they blow tires. And I was there when I just did coordinate a release. Air Force came in from the wood pile, they brought in two of the C 130s, landed, they blew out six tires. <laughs> and so it, we had to get all the tires from Saigon, they got them out there, finally got them on the aircraft, and then they swept the whole runway, it was all of these bad spots out. And that helped a great deal. But anyway, when I was there at 10 o'clock at night, we got the tires on dark, and then pilots came up to me and said, we're leaving. I said, you can't leave now. I mean, here it is dark, you don't have any lights on the runway, we're leaving. They had lights on the aircraft and took off. <laughs> but anyway, some of the problems like that, we had problems with weather. We'd have uh, releases up north, and Camp Evans right up on the border there, near the Takan River. And, uh, Many times we had rain, we had to readjust our schedules. We had uh, the prisoners were guarded by South Vietnamese uh, guards, and uh, we had trouble keeping them in line because they would go back and leave, and we, we never had enough many times to get on the aircraft. But anyway, we finally did. But well, we kept those releases going, and uh, we, we had. Some, some problems, give me one of them. They called me one time and said, I'm always supplying at the war party. And he uh, says, we got a bunch of uh, South Vietnamese soldiers, badly wounded them, Tam Keen. Tam Keen's right up in this area up here. Yeah, two of them, except for the north. Anyway, it was a high mountainous area, flew into there, made arrangements to come back the next week. They had a landing zone at the time. Come back next week to get some aircraft and take those badly wounded out. And they come in to land right off the side of the LZ machine gun fire. Bam, bam, bam. We're flying with South Vietnamese pilots because all over you was moving out of there. 
and it almost knocked us out of the sky. No one got killed. But it just gives you, they didn't know the war's over. We ran into a number of times that the North and even the Viet Cong didn't know that the war was over. And that's what happened on this occasion. So later on, took a, a couple of weeks later, Bunny came back and got those out of there. But it went on day in, day out. We go to all these relief sites. We had several others. <clears throat> we had Kanto in the, the lower part down in here. Kanto. Okay. And we had Benoit, Play Kuhn, Queen Yan. Those camps all had prisoners of war. But we did get them moving, and by God, it was going pretty good. Halfway through um, my assignment, they said, McDonald, we're pulling you out of the, the team for a short period you're going to handle. So I flew in with another uh, officer, flew into Hanoi, into Jalam Airfield. Jalam Airfield was very really badly damaged. But it was, uh, during the wet season, we got off and went to the aviation building that they had the number of pets there. And uh, <clears throat> we went and had a meeting. And they said, take you from here onto into what they call the Hilton. Well, the Hilton is the Wallow Prison. Prisoners named it the Hilton. They had four other prisons up in Hanlon. One was by our prisoners called the Briar Patch. Fire Gate, Zoo, and Country Club. <laughs> that was our prisoner's name for him. But there was two of them within Hanoi, two on the outside. But the Hilton you know, was the main prison. Big, it almost was like a French Bastille. It was huge. And so when they, we hadn't finished our meeting at the airfield, they drove us to a little road we went uh, about two miles until we got to the river and we we're going to go over a bridge. The bridge was just open the day before we got there. It was heavily bombed. So we went over the other side and went past the railway marshaling yard. The Air Force obliterated that marshaling yard. There was nothing left of it. And there were people out picking up bricks and so forth. Saw some workers there. And, and when we got on the other side, the one started going through Hanover. I'll show you a few pictures later on. Beautiful city. We did not bomb anything within that city. The International Control Commission, a couple of guys on the Canadians told me that they, they went almost to every release there. And they said that uh, we were really pretty active. Drove through the center of the town. It took us about 20 minutes to get to the, the prison. And we went by some beautiful French designed homes, a lot of air raid shelters along the way. People were wearing the same kind of uh, clothing that they did in South Vietnam, except it was a little bit different. They didn't, didn't ride any cars, didn't have any cars, they had any bikes, and uh, just weren't uh, as modern as Saigon was. But it was very beautiful, actually. So we got along there, and there's a big lake on the one side, and the driver turned around and he says, see that lake? I said, yes. He said, that's where John McCain landed. And John McCain, when he shot down, parachuted, hit that lake. They took him out of the lake. He was badly injured. Took him to the Wallow Prison. And he was in there when I was there, but I did not meet with John McCain at that time. We got to the prison, a lot of people out. They knew something was going on. And so I got out and met with the prison commander, this other officer, and I did. And uh, he says, we've been doing this a couple of releases before this. He says, I'd like to go through the process and see if you agree. And uh, I said, fine. We sat down and went through it. And so we decided the other prisons, rather than have a release from each of those, made it a lot harder. They would bring them from those prisons to the Wallow prison. And then we'd release them at that location. That made sense. And uh, he says, I'll give you a tour around, and I'm not going to follow you. I got a guy. He said, I want you to go through the prison and take a look at it. When I went through that prison, it was huge. We had a lot of cell blocks that had about 25 prisoners, and a number of cell blocks that hold 10. 
And so went through it and then they said, are you satisfied? I said, yeah, I've seen it all. He said, okay, we'll take you to a group that we would like to release today. So we went into the cell block, had about 25 prisoners in there. I stepped in the door and they looked at me. I saw that I had an army uniform on. God, did they run to me. It was emotional. They took my hand and said, are we getting out of here today? This is the day you're getting out of here. They just went wild. And every one of them I talked to. And uh, they were excited. But you can see, and I've seen a number of prisoners during this time. And they were not well treated. I asked some questions. And they never allowed anybody to ask questions before. I said, what was the treatment like? In the interrogation regularly. They didn't get the information. Fist to the head. Right the butt to the head, and they strung them up by their arms. Now there was a guy in there, very famous, but the Air Force Colonel, Middle of Honor, Winter. He was John McCain's roommate. He was on for a long period of time. And his, his shoulder was so bad that he could use his hands. It was really bad. So they did that on a regular basis. I said, Do you ever get any mail? So we don't get meals there. What's meals like? Terrible. <laughs> Except they said they knew two months ahead that there was going to be a peace agreement. And they started feeding them much better. And so they said it was better, but I could tell the wear on prisoners. The old team probably didn't get the price very much. Uh, there were several of them in pretty good shape, but others. Uh, a corporal Marine Corps, real tall fellow. He couldn't talk. I mean, he was in bad shape. Several of them in there couldn't use their legs. Several had real bad injuries. And you could just see there was a problem. But anyway, they were excited. And I had talked with them for a couple hours and they said, Now, what are we going to do? And this was agreement by the the prisoner commander, they're going to give him civilian clothing. And I'll put that on, including shoes. Now, they're in prison uniforms. They were white and black pajama type. Things, and they were wearing the sandals cut out of tires. And they tried to get those shoes on. They gave me civilian shoes. And they had a hard time getting into the civilian clothes and shoes. But it was, it happened. So they, Got that done about mid-afternoon. I also went in the other cell block. It was 10. But they were a number from the civilians that were from the Philippines working for the U.S. government. And they brought a couple of um, medics from another area to me. One was a lady and a man. They were both medics working for the U.S. government. So in all told, they were going to release 34 of them that day as a test. So they did. So about mid-afternoon, I drove to Jalam Airfield, got there, and uh, there was an Air Force Brigadier General and a recruiting group there, and a beautiful C-141 sitting on their runway. And they let the prisoners out, they called their name, and they each one reported to General, he marked them off, and they went to the aircraft and got in. And there was one badly wounded corporal can only use crutches, his legs were completely shot. And he drug himself along, using the crutches as feet. He came up to me and he said, Sir, when I get on that airplane, I'm going to do it myself. He said, I don't want anybody to help me. He gave me his crutches and he crawled up those steps, got up the top, pulled himself up, threw it everybody down below, and I tell you, Everybody in that aircraft, you should have heard of They were clapping and yelping. And he took his crutches up to him. He entered the aircraft and taxied off and flew to Clark Air Force Base. And anyway, they were processed there. And anybody that needed some medical attention, they took care of them there. And then they flew on to Hawaii and back to the United States. So that afternoon after they were gone, 
I got in C-130, the other guy, and we flew back south Vietnam and we continued our work with the commission. And the next day, I went north, up to the northern part of Vietnam, up in the jungle area, and the enemy had about 24 of our guys held in tiger cages, metal cages down on the ground, underneath, and you could tell those guys were in bad shape. And um, they would feed them through the top, and rarely did they get up. They could pull the whole cage out of the ground. And they were held there, I don't know how long, but anyway, this was near Lock Nien. So I got them out of there, I took them to Lock Nien, and uh, of course, they, they got out. Uh, and they were so happy, I'll tell you. There was one guy in there that I, he was badly wounded, Air Force, Officer, and later on when I was stationed in Washington, he was in an Air Force base right next to us. We became friends. He was an enemy. He was an 06, name as I was at the time. And, uh, and I was at Fort Lewis, and he was in McCord Air Force Base. And so we saw each other every now and then. And out of the 34 that was released that day, one guy was a CEO. One of the battalions I commanded later on, I had two guys that, in that short little visit, it was that way. But we established the procedure and then it continued the release from the Vietnam. There were 655 released there, U.S. prisoners. Mm -hmm. There are the 24 that I got out of there, the North Park Battalion Tiger Cages. And after we did all of the releases, 26,508 of the prisoners that we held, enemy prisoners, were traded. 200, I think it was 238 refused repatriation. They put them back in Benoit prison, and they were there, there when I left the country, so I don't know what happened to them. But anyway, uh, the last day I was there, I was in Cambodia. They had a number of South Vietnamese soldiers there. And they, they used some of the Cambodia that came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and they came down. And they, they had facilities over. So we went in with the team and it became so belligerent. They were so bad that I had to pull the team out of there. They, they were not cooperating with it. And when we left, I don't know what happened to those prisoners. I hope they got them back. But the very next day, says McDonald, they're out of here with the last eight of you guys. So we flew out the next day, flew to Anchorage, back to the United States, and, the, and MACB headquarters was still operational. We, we traded, traded for the 60 days, 27 March was the last day of trading. So we, we had uh, MACB, left about 15 people there to close it down. And they eventually got the headquarters closed down, and that was the end of the war. And of course, we know what happened two years later, they broke the agreement. We attacked South Vietnam, we didn't do anything to go back and help. And of course, the country is in control of the communists. But the influence that we had as Americans there, they're quite productive, I guess, today. And economically, they're a lot better than the North. But anyway, I, I've never been that. So that was kind of my story. And if you had any questions, I'll get into it. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions I uh, thought of right when you uh, mentioned your first tour yeah. is that you worked with the villages. What was your sense of the villages uh, with regard to the north south and the conflict that was going on? The village chiefs they, they knew that they were in trouble. They, they you know, they were worried about Viet Cong primarily because that's the yeah, there are some of their own people were in those villages. They were Viet Cong too, and they were concerned about. How do we protect ourselves? So, and it, it, we try to give them some of the basics. We did provide them with some of the weapons that they didn't have, what I understand from the Mackey headquarters. But we go to the village chiefs and also some of the section uh, chiefs. And they, you know, they had about 40, 4,100 little villages. And so we'd spend two weeks with them, trying to advise them you know, security at night and so forth. And, and, uh, did, would they would they volunteer identify, to identify the Viet Cong that they knew? Yes, 
They were quite floppy. Most of the village chiefs, they were pretty good. And so they tried to clue us in, and so we passed that on to our horses. And I think they made some improvement there, but that went on that entire time I was there. You know, that was in 65. Yeah, or, yeah, 65. I was 67, 68. Yeah. yeah, that's when I was there, 67, 68. Then I was there 72 until the end of the war. Anybody had any questions? I, I can answer some. I don't know everything, but I, <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. Uh, you had mentioned something about uh, the prisoners being in tiger cages. Yes. In, in the ground. Yes. Okay. So that prompted me to ask, were there different levels of imprisonment? Why were those people down there at some more? Different there? levels. Because they had the country, you know, most of the prisoners that they had, they either walked to Hanoi or they just flew them up there. But other times they, they just had prisoners, they didn't do anything with them. So they put them in the tiger, tiger cages, easier, I guess. But anyway, that's the only time that I saw U.S. prisoners uh, in South Vietnam in that situation. Now we had 23 prisoners die. I mean, that did die. There's more than that had died in captivity. But later on, they had a prisoner war information center in Hawaii. And they worked after the war was over to recover remains of prisoners. They did recover all the 23 that was buried in Hanoi. And there was others throughout South Vietnam, but they worked for a long time. I don't think they were too successful in getting a lot of information people out of there. Remember them operating. Anybody else have any? Yes, yeah, sir. So I heard you mention 34 and then was it 20 something? Were there, how many total Americans were repatriated? 655. 655. There's 4,946 or something like South Vietnamese soldiers brought back. And of course, we had 26,608 returned. But there we had more, there's a number on the refuge repatriation, it's 328 of those. And they stayed in country, so I don't know what happened to them. They put them in the Benoit prison. Were there the U.S. soldiers that decided to stay there? No, this is not Vietnamese. They, they, not to they didn't want to be repatriated, they didn't want to go back. Okay. They said, yeah. we're, we're staying. And so they, then we had all this other 10,891 of them that you know, pledged, they were mostly Viet Cong. But they, they pledged to support South Vietnamese government. That's why we released them first. But most of the prisoners, uh, <clears throat> there was 913 female prisoners at Kanto, Viet Cong. They weren't really nice people either. But I talked to the camp commander there, got to tell you that story. They were on a lake where the prison was. Long ago, walking deck goes out, and then there's a little facility sitting there. And I said, what is that? He says, well, all the women use this as a retreat. And then they had a lot of fish in there, mainly uh, the carp. <laughs> they sang the carp out, and of course, you know what the carp was eating. Down in Tantor, in the, uh, Tantor, the village. Square down the marketplace or something fish. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's just economics. <laughs> but anyway, we had some of those kind of situations. So it but I ran into a, a lot of close uh, encounters because uh, a lot of the Viet Cong Viet Cong didn't know the war was over. So that's what a lot of our problem was. Or we didn't want to go. Yeah, yeah, didn't want to go. So, <clears throat> obviously, I want to go back. Of course, it was a very unpopular war. And I landed in the United States. My wife picked me up. There wasn't anybody there. We went home. <laughs> and I was it. Yes, sir. You said uh, you went up to Hanoi Hill. You were in uniform. Yes. Uh, so, what other security did you have in, in the form of other so had no security whatsoever. And you know, when they got into that little van, Here's the driver and this other guy, officer and I, and a few other people were in there. In the international control station. We drove down through town, we had no security. Did they have a sidearm? No, 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 no sidearm. 
didn't take the sidearm. They didn't want me to take pictures either, so I couldn't take any pictures inside the prison. But I did sneak it, a few prison, uh, pictures going through Hanoi that I can show those. You want, to, you want to do that now? Yeah, yeah, if they could. <clears throat> yeah. Here, here's the front of the prison right here. And it was rather large. It's a side picture I got for that. Go ahead and click the next one. This is the lake that John McCain got shot down. <laughs> And you can see the people walking and they all the architecture of the building. Yeah, the architecture is beautiful. A lot of French design, beautiful building. Three. And I'm a very attractive uh, city of this is long. This is a colonel, a Polish colonel, an international control commission. I talked with him quite a bit, but he was trying to control the crowd out there. There were some that were not very happy with what they saw. And uh, so he was telling out there to control. Like a lot of young kids there. Yeah, a lot. So you can see a lot of young people. Yeah. They're okay. interested. They wondered what's going on. What's going on here? Go ahead and click the next one. This is the railway marshalling yard. You can see how badly it was damaged. Totally not usable. But anyway, we went right past that. Next one. Here's the bridge we went over, and that was just open the day before, as I said. There was damage is that going and, into Hanoi? Yeah, going into Hanoi. And the next one, here, here's one of their homes. Big, beautiful home. They ride bicycles. You can see the same kind of attire that they were in South Vietnam. And here, he even had uh, a train complex. So he goes through the, the village. So they ride on the that. cable car? Yeah, it's kind of like an electric train. Yeah, yeah, electric like train. Can see yeah, electric train. Oh, yeah. But you can see the oh. of people there. Here are the people in front of the. Yeah, good. good yeah, they're, they're the people who just wondered what's going on here. You know? So we got past them in there. This is another picture that I took. And I said 900 prisoners. These are all women prisoners. They were all traded in the uh, uh, lock meeting. Here's the, the little boats we're using. <laughs> Arcade, not very good, but I couldn't use the bridge, so they were going across. But these prisoners, you can see, they took off their clothes and threw it in the water. Protesting, these are no fit for these soldiers. <laughs> kind of getting smart. But anyway, we ran a number of them across on that. And here, here are some that were down in Mach We brought out of the pages. These guys were happy, I'll tell you. And it was so good. We used the 130, and they chose that to move prisoners because uh, you just get about 100 in there and that's how many flights we needed. Just regular flights going all the time. But anyway, that the aircraft was used. And down below, when we went over the bridge, this is a communist plane, but they had some farming facilities down there. I just took that picture. Go ahead and Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the reason I didn't get a lot, they said you can't take pictures, and I snuck those pictures up. <laughs> That's right through the little bus. Yes, sir. I'm curious, were you uh, back in the States uh, when the boys and the men were brought back? I was in San Diego in 73. Oh, when, okay. When they flew them in and they took them to Balboa Naval Hospital. I was a, were you? I was a Navy Jaguar. Um, I didn't have anything to do with meeting them. Working with them, but some other Jaguars did. And friend of stories we heard about the shape they were in at the hospital. Yeah, and it's amazing. Of course, and, you know, I, when we were, I went down to Fuqua Island, and we had so many in there. We ran it just like we do in the army. Because we didn't punish, we didn't do any of that. But they all came out of there pretty <clears> good. <throat> Not the case, something more. So two questions. Number one, uh, uh, I, I, you may have already answered this, but I didn't hear it. Uh, have you been back to Vietnam? No. <laughs> uh, have you maintained any acquaintances of Vietnamese uh, since uh, since you returned? Yeah, during my Vietnam, I can't speak it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did make some Vietnamese friends. They did make some on the commission, uh, especially the Canadians, but I never wanted to go back. I didn't lose anything there, so I 
just didn't have an interest in going back. Uh, my brother did. We went back and visited Hanoi, went through the Hilton, and uh, did some of that, but I, I did not. And when I come back, I said, that's not been back either. Yeah. Okay. Anybody <laughs> else? Based on what you know, yeah. you got any concern that we left any guys behind? No. I don't think so. <clears throat> I tell you, it was hard enough to see, you know, to live by yourself. And, and I think the first year I ate with the Vietnamese all the time. Not the best thing in the world. <laughs> but I would think that uh, they would not have anybody alive. <laughs> My feeling of going around the entire, uh, I would pretty much cover South Vietnam uh, all the way on my travels, looking for release sites and that type. But there are some, I'm sure, that are dead, but never find you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm assuming the majority of our prisoners in Hanoi were officer grade. Um, did they ever take uh, prisoners of war, like American prisoners of war, from the South? No. Infantrymen and marching up. Absolutely, they did. So how many? What was the population of? Officers versus enlisted. I would say that it's pretty even. That's cool. Well, really? Yeah, you know, there's quite a few NCOs, quite a few enlisted persons that I yeah. saw. And they were all captured in the South. Yeah, they were captured south, taken to the north. But well, were they all aviators? No, not at all. Yeah. Most, yeah. Very few aviators, so most of them combat uh, people. Yeah. And we uh, had a lot of Marine Corps types in there and had some civilians who worked for our government. And, but there was some aviators, sir. Uh, but on that release, I was episode 34, there was a, a captain, uh, his officer, very strong. He really looked good. There's only a couple of them that really looked pretty, pretty strong in there, and the rest of them did not. But it was, uh, I would say, a pretty good, even mix of officer and then just a mix. Over here. Yes, sir. What was the exchange rate? One for one? No. The fact is, the coordination where I worked, I only was uh, doing North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. Okay. And they sent me to Hanoi because I could speak the language and I didn't need an interpreter translator. And I was working with that, so I was saying, McDonald, you're going out there. but. Uh, they, they released them at their own level. And I only took 38 core that time. I think it took a lot more at other times, I'm sure. And then we had the control commission was in there on those releases. And so ours were not even coordinated with theirs. Mm -hmm. And so I have no no idea other than that one release I was on, how often they did it. But they did agree to bring all the prisoners out of those other prisons, put them in the wall prison and release them from there. That was a lot easier for us to be there and just witness it and bring it back. Mm -hmm. And all the prisoners had to be released in the 60 days? In 60 days, yes. On both sides? Yeah, both sides. And so March 27th, that was it, you know. And by golly, they got them, they got them done. And boy, we have a lot of flights in. And you, know, you could imagine that we had to cancel because of weather and certain things. Air Force was just really good. And then at times, if we couldn't get, you know, we had to establish about three, five really sites, two of the major ones, but we found that there were other areas we needed to have releases. We might have to use trucks, uh, C-47s, CH-47 helicopters to get them, the Vietnamese would fly them there. What was the rationale on releasing people uh, south of the river when they needed to be north of the river? You couldn't find a place north of the river to no. deliver them? They said by the accords, they said all prisoners would be released in South Vietnam. Oh. All of once on our side. Uh, on their side. They would be released in on North their, Vietnam. Yeah. So you, we didn't, you had to get them. Yeah, so everything was on the south side for the North Vietnamese and Vietnam <clears throat> in the course of but anyway, and, uh, it was a kind of hearing experience sometimes, you know, just because to see how bad shape some of them were. And some of them are pretty good shape. Some of the Philippine civilians, they, they endured it better than some others. There were about seven or so, I think. They had about 35 civilians released, I think, all told that they released. 
One thing that we didn't get to talk about a little bit, but sort of predecessor to this whole exchange was um, the Mac prior to going north and doing all that stuff, Mac coordinated directly with Kissinger's team in Paris during the formation of the Paris Peace Accords as it related to this prisoner exchange. What would be the protocols? For the prisoner exchange that they adopted and implemented as part of the peace treaty that the first yeah that protocol and, and that protocol he followed he was the first one to go up and get that select number of 34 prisoners to execute that protocol which like we all know tests the protocol and then all subsequent releases yeah. conducted um were following the protocol so they didn't have that. And I, yeah. didn't, I didn't get to follow that because I, when I went back, you went out, I, I started again getting releases of theirs. And I had no uh, no coordination with the uh, the U.S. prisoners coming out of it. It was totally different. Yes, sir. Simply as a veteran, thank you very much for all that you did for our prisoners of war. Sir. Right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, I think at least I felt when I come back and did something good for for our side. Anyway, but that there was some. Well, Bob, thank you so much for okay. sharing your story with us. Oh, good okay. one of our. Okay, yes, thank you. Should I take this one off? Uh, well, please uh, stick around, talk some more with yeah. Matt, and you'll visit with his in if you have any stairs. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget our new McDivitt upstairs for our founders, too. Watch the morning. Did you have to flip with it? Did you go back to the southern part of town?